So um, what I'm going to talk about today is machine learning for healthcare data. Um, so there's been a lot of work, as you can tell from this meeting, right, there's been a lot of work in this area. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about all of it. Mostly what I'm going to do is just give you guys a snapshot of what's going on in our group. Uh, because probably other people are way more qualified to talk about what's going on in their own groups. Um, so, yeah, so um, machine learning for healthcare data in our group, um, what I'll talk about is, is kind of as follows. So, um, so there's a bunch of work that has to do with electronic health records data at Duke University Command of the Hospital System. Um, a lot of the modeling that we've done is gas and process based, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, in particular, two different projects that our group has done. The first is on chronic kidney disease, and the second is on sepsis, and we're hoping to have the sepsis work implemented in our hospital system soon. Um, I'll also talk about um, trying to predict cervical complications for surgery patients. Um, and this is done in part locally from data at Duke, but also in part from um, a national database that is collected uh, on surgery patients across the country. Um, and this uh, database is collected by a program called the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program. Um, and I'll talk about a couple of different uh, pieces of work that we've done relating to that, including clustering procedural codes and, and um, transfer learning models that we're working on. So I should also mention that a lot of this work is pretty new, so it's been published. Um, some of it has, it has been published here, and some of it is work in progress, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and the last thing I want to try to address is um, mobile apps. So we have data not only for inpatients at Duke Hospital, but also um, Duke runs um, a set of clinics, a set of application clinics. Um, and we're trying to um, do stuff which is good for them also. So um, I have worked with a neurologist at Duke to create a, a mobile app called MS Mosaic for, for patients with multiple sclerosis to try to collect more data on that. Um, and it should be released in the next like two-ish weeks. Um, and so I'll give a, give a plug for that and show you a little bit about it. Okay, so again, the first thing I'm going to talk about is chronic kidney disease. And this is kind of like a motivating example for why we care about chronic kidney disease. And this comes from somebody who uh, was treated at Duke University Hospital. On the y-axis, what you see is a representation of kidney function. It's eGFR, so it's an estimated GFR. Um, Basically, like some, something which determines how well your kidneys are function, functioning. The E is for estimated because um, actually measuring GFR is an intrusive procedure on the, on the person where you have to go and measure EGFR levels in a person's kidneys, and we don't like to do that. Um, and so, this is um, probably a suboptimal way of measuring uh, GFR, uh, measure, measuring GFR, which is like a linear equation that's mostly based off of a particular lab value called creatinine, but also takes into consideration somebody's age and gender and race and stuff like that. Um, on the x-axis is the person's age. Um, and so what you can see is at age 47, um, they had untreated diabetes and high blood pressure. They had pretty normal kidney functioning, but with some evidence of kidney damage, and they didn't have any regular medical care. By age 49, their kidney functioning was now 50% of what it should be. By age 51, um, they were referred to a kidney specialist. So what, what I should emphasize is that at age 51, it was the first time they were referred to a kidney specialist even though they were giving off of the, off the values that, that you see above you. And then three months later, they presented to the emergency room with kidney failure and crash started dialysis. So crash starting di dialysis is really bad because it's an incredibly costly procedure. It's the most costly one-off procedure somebody can have. It's also incredibly dangerous for the patient, right? So all kinds of lines have to be inserted into their body on an emergency basis, and they run the risk of infection and all kinds of bad things. 
Um, and so they looked out the rest of their life on dialysis. Um, they had obviously lots of problems. Um, but when the nephrologists that I collaborate with and I look at this, basically what we see is a whole bunch of missed opportunities, right? There was the missed opportunity to prevent or delay kidney failure, and there was also the missed opportunity to prepare the patient for kidney failure. So, like, one of the things that can be done is, like, you can have a surgical operation in the year leading up to um, the start of dialysis so that you're not going through quite so, so dangerous kinds of, kinds of crash starting, uh, crash starting. Uh, procedures. Okay, so 42% of patients starting dialysis have had no prior nephrology care. Less than 10% of people with moderate chronic kidney disease and less than 50% of people with severe chronic kidney disease are even aware that they have a problem with their kidneys. Um, and part of the reason for this, I think, if you look back at the previous plot, like something I should have pointed out, so if you look at an EGFR rating of 30, this is kind of like a threshold value that clinicians use in order to refer, to refer people to, to a nephrologist, or there's, there's one even lower which is used to um, put somebody, decide to put somebody on dialysis. Um, and so when you talk about clinicians and you talk about the way that they're thinking and treating patients, right, there's this very sort of like thresholdy thinking with thresholds set in a way that we're not, we, we don't know exactly where they came from. They seem to be things that we developed as guidelines over a number of years. Um, and so um, what we became interested in is, is can, can we do better than this? Can we do better than this by basically like, saying, okay, we've got some kind of trajectory model, right, for this patient, um, and we're going to use that trajectory model to, to predict what their EGFR or other values are going to look like out into the future. And so one of the things that we used to do this are Gaussian processes. So you can imagine that Gaussian processes make for good sort of trajectory, trajectory models, right, their longitudinal regression. Um, and so uh, the work that we chose to go off of was uh, work that was presented by Shula Mansaria and in 2015, right? So we have a gassing process with a mean function which takes into consideration somebody's individual covariance for a population effect, and then it tries to group that person into a particular subgroup that we think that they might be a member of. So people's trajectories can look very different depending on what what kind of properties they have, right? So they can, um, unlike the patient that we saw, right, they can have a decrease in EGFR that then plateaus and they never need to go on dialysis. Um, and, and then they have sort of like individual long-term variations and individual transient uh, deviations, which we model using an Orsteno kernel. Um, one of the things that we're interested in doing when we look at chronic kidney disease is being able to measure, to model more than one trajectory at once. So as you can imagine, in a hospital setting or in a, a medical setting, one of the things that you have is lots of different lab values, right? So you're really looking at lots of different kinds of like longitudinal trajectories and predictions that you want to be able to make together. And one of the things that you want to do is to be able to correlate some of the values that we talked about across different kinds of log values, right? So we looked at correlating um, weights on individual long-term variations through a normal distribution, and we also looked at correlating what kind of group membership the people had um, using a mature multinomials. Um, and we looked at this uh, across six variables of, of interest, so uh, EGFR, which I talked about as a measure of kidney function, and five other lot values that are relevant to chronic kidney disease. We looked at a cohort of four, 44,000 patients at Duke University, so Duke University is the university that we're from and the university associated with patients to whom we have access. Um, and 44,000 patients with at least moderate CKD, that's basically the patients that we could see. Um, and then for each test patient, uh, we tried to use data before a particular time to be able to predict future lot values. And what we see is we did, um, we did, we had an improved, an improvement in being able to predict um, what the different sort of longitudinal trajectories look like for various lab values that are associated with chronic kidney disease by using this multivariate model. 
that's basically the takeaway with the dependency structure. Another thing that we were interested in is looking at can we um, predict a particular trajectory and at the same time predict some of the other like really bad stuff that tends to happen to chronic kidney disease patients, right? So you can imagine if you're having problems with your kidney functioning, um, there are all kinds of other bad things that might go along with that. So you might have a heart attack, you might have a stroke, um, et cetera. And so one of the things that we're interested in doing is saying, okay, can we predict what your, what your kidney function is going to look like, but at, but at the same time also look at your risk for having a heart attack or a stroke or one of these other adverse events. And so, um, so we have a proposed joint model, we've had a proposed joint model, um, and this is basically um, a conditionally independent model where we can say, okay, condition on some of these variables that, that we're interested in, like the subgroup that you belong to, like the weights for the individual long-term deviations that you have. Can we both have this like GP model that I talked about for your EGFR and also a point process model for looking at these adverse events? Um, so for the point process model, basically what we use is just the standard Poisson process model with the conditional likelihood on events. And the rate function that we use basically is a standard, a pretty standard rate function, um, which looks at the person's covariance and um, uh, some, kinds, some kinds of random effects, but, uh, but also uh, is conditioned on the mean and slope of the person's kidney, lock, kidney functioning, right, of the EGFR value that we're modeling with the Gaussian process of same time. So we want to say, okay, well, how well does this joint model work when we're looking at somebody's kidney functioning along with their chances of having some kind of adverse event, like a heart attack or a stroke? So we looked at 23,450 patients with moderate CKD um, and 10, 10 plus uh, EGFR or kidney functioning ratings at, um, at Duke University. 13.4% of those had a, a stroke, um, and 17.4% of those had had at least one heart attack um, in, the, in the course of time that they'd been followed at Duke University. And what we're able to get are things like this. I'm, I'm, I'm not showing you the exact numbers of our quantitative results, but if you want, this was published at UAL last year, and you can go look it up. Um, but this is the kind of thing that we get out, right? So this is, um, uh, a plot basically showing one person over time, um, and so there's a light blue vertical line, and that shows where we've conditioned, right? So everything to the left of that light blue vertical line are our data that we've conditioned on, and everything to the right of the light blue vertical line um, is what we're predicting, right? So um, on the x-axis, we have I get the GFR and the probability of, a, of an adverse event happening on, a, on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, we basically have time. Um, and so you can see with our Gaussian process model, we're able to predict what the mean trajectory is likely to look like for the person in terms of their GFR values or their kidney functioning. And with the red line that's at the bottom, we can predict how likely they are to have to be having an adverse event, such as a heart attack or a stroke. And so the mean is shown in dark red, and the confidence intervals are given in light, light red. The same thing for the black with the prediction of their kidney functioning. And so what we can see is that as we shift the light blue vertical line forward, um, we can do a better job of predicting what the course of their, um, of their kidney functioning is going to look like, but also um, to predict that they're more and more likely to have, be having these adverse events. So, so particularly like once they've already had one, their chances of having another one goes way up. Okay, so that's all pretty much I have to say about chronic kidney disease. Um, another thing that we're working on um, along the same modeling lines is sepsis and looking at trying to predict whether or not a patient admitted to Duke University Hospital is at risk of having sepsis or not. This is also going to be using Gaussian process sort of longitudinal model. Okay, so um, sepsis is a life-threatening complication from infection. 
Um, there are 750,000, there are over 750,000 new sepsis cases every year in the U.S. with like a very high level of mortality. So 30 to 50 percent of people who are diagnosed with some sepsis end up, end up dying um, from that infection. Um, and so one of the things that, that really helps is if you can predict sepsis early, if you can start treating it early, the mortality rate goes up. And so what we'd like to do is we'd like to predict it um, as early as possible. Um, what Duke uses right now is called uh, NEWS. It's the National Early Warning Score System. Um, and basically, uh, you can see on the the on the rows, basically, like you're looking at a whole bunch of physiological parameters for a particular patient, right? Their respiration rate, their oxygen saturation level, their blood pressure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and as you go across uh, the different columns, it tells you what number of points to add in. Um, and so zero would kind of be the normal range, and then as you deviate from that, either high or low, you're adding in more points, right? And so you sum it up across the different rows, and you look at the person's overall score. And again, this is a very kind of threshold -y kind of thing where you're like, if the patient crosses a particular threshold, then we're going to say that they're at risk for decompensation or for sepsis. Um, this National Early Warning Score System isn't really that good. So, for example, if you look at the systolic blood pressure row, um, you can see that if you have a systolic blood pressure of 219, you have zero points added in. But if you have a systolic blood pressure of 220, you have three points added in, right? So, I, you know, it's not clear exactly where this came from. It's not very sophisticated. And again, we looked at this and we were like, we can probably do significantly better. Um, one of the things, one of the problems with this score system is, um, is also that it results in a lot of false alarms. So um, one of the things that happens a lot at Duke is like the new score alerts and like the nurse is just like, I've seen 50 million of those today, I'm going to turn you off, right? Um, and so that's something that we wanted to look out for. So we want something that gives high precision, but we don't want it to give too many false alarms because then people will just get alarm fatigue and ignore it. Okay, so... Um, so if you think about a patient that comes into Duke Hospital, what do they have? They have a lot of vitals that are being measured almost continuously, and they have a lot of lot values that are being taken, and those lot values are being taken extremely irregularly. So overall, what you have is a whole bunch of data that's taken at really irregular time intervals, and, and one patient is not going to align well with, you, with, with another. So, um, in order to feed it into a particular classifier to tell us whether or not this patient is at risk of having sepsis, one of the things we really want to be able to do is to be able to have some kind of alignment along some particular time points. Um, and in order to be able to do this, what we use is gassing processes to try to, to try to estimate what their lab values or what the vitals are like at a particular time and kind of try to get us there. Um, the nice thing about gassing processes is also obviously that it's it's something which takes uncertainty into account, and you'll see uncertainty then being able to be propagated throughout this entire end-to-end -end system of the gassing process plus the classifier. Um, so we use the gassing process in order to try to estimate, come up with a posterior estimate for what this person's labs or vitals might be like at a particular time. Um, we then feed it into a particular classifier. Um, the classifier predicts, is this person likely to have sepsis or not? We want to be able to minimize some kind of loss function, saying this is the prediction that we're getting out, this is the true value that we're training on. Um, this uh, minimization basically means that we need to take a, gr a gradient of an expectation in order to do this optimization. Um, and so we have a whole bunch of tricks in order to try to make, um, to try to make um, uh, inference faster and this kind of this kind of scheme in order to do end-to-end -end learning. And this work really um, 
comes off a bit of the lean and marlin paper, which was at uh, NIFS last year, but some of the tricks we use are the reparameterization trick of, of like came out of the well uh, We try to approximate tractable expectations with a few Monte Carlo samples. I know a lot of people use one Monte Carlo sample, but we found that that's not really awesome in our case, so we use more like 10 Monte Carlo samples. Um, and uh, we use conjugate gradients in order to get the GP means and covariances, um, and use the Langstos method in order um, to be able to draw samples from a large normal. Okay, um, so, so we have a, a multivariate time series, like I've discussed, many lab values, many vitals. Um, there's a highly variable uh, length of the person staying in the hospital. So uh, many people stay less than 12 hours, but some people stay more than like 10 days. Uh, and so we want to be able to use these clinically clinical time series. Uh, the baseline covariance of the person and the times that medications were administered because they're going to affect a person's uh, labs and lab values and vitals, etc. Uh, in order to, to be able to do this kind of prediction, right? So uh, we adjust uh, the mean to take into consideration what various medications have been administered. So it's like, again, like if you were administered some, some kind of medication five hours ago, we take that to account in the mean in terms of like, okay, we expect that medication to then uh, affect what kind of vitals readings we're getting. And we use um, a, a, a somewhat separable kernel. So basically like a gas import process normally correlates different parts of time together, but we also want to correlate all of our different time series together, right? So we have, again, have 31 time series, and we want to be able to, to correlate them. Um, and we use our RNF classifier with about six different layers. Okay, so here's an example. I gave you an example of somebody who had chronic kidney disease, and now I'm about to give you some, an example of somebody at Duke Hospital who we saw who had sepsis. Um, okay, so this person uh, comes in, and they have a history of cardiac problems, and they come in complaining about uh, chest pains and are basically prepped for surgery right away. They go through surgery, um, and at first they seem stable, but very quickly started destabilizing. They ended up in the ICU. Um, they had a whole bunch of vitals that were like temperature and pulse that were rising, and a bunch of plot values that went along with that. At this point, oh, I'm sorry. So the black line that you're seeing at the top is the risk prediction that our model is making in terms of like predicting whether or not somebody has sepsis. Um, and the other, I think the other values are given on there in the, in the little key. Um, but uh, the, the things that are below it are uh, the different vitals um, and, and some, some labs that the patient had. So at the bottom is creatinine, white blood cell count, respiration rate, pulse temperature, et cetera. Um, and that's what you're seeing going across. And then the black line going across is, is the predictions that our model is making along with when antibiotics were administered by, uh, by doctors and when other things happen. Okay, so they came out of surgery, they ended up in ICU, they had all kinds of problems with their vitals and labs. Um, they had a high lactate lab, which is um, somewhat reflective of, of having sepsis. At this point in time, our model is extremely confident that this is a person with sepsis. Um, and so, as you can see, the blue dots, so they give you, what you see in terms of the blue dots over at the left, they give you antibiotics before they, they put you in surgery. This was not because the patient looked like they were having sepsis at that point in time. Um, but it, it took a very long time, but eventually the physicians started catching on that this is a person with sepsis. They started administering antibiotics, and the red line basically indicates the first point in time in which the patient qualified met the definitions of, of having sepsis. So um, I think we were talking about this earlier, but like the exact definition of sepsis, like a lot of other things in medicine, it's a little shaky, right? It's like not really clear what the exact definition is or should be. But as the definition currently stands, the first time that they met the definition of having sepsis was given by, this, by the line in red. 
Um, and uh, finally, with the red X all the way on the bottom left, they figured out what the source of the infection was, and the infection was IQ. Okay, and so we look at this, and what do we see? We see, well, there's 17 hours in there between when I, we were able to predict that the patient was at high risk of having sepsis and when the person was first administered antibiotics, as in like when the physician started like suspecting that they might have sepsis. And 36 hours between when our, when our model started predicting that the person might have sepsis or had a high likelihood of sepsis and when they met the clinical definition of having sepsis. Um, and so we look at this and we basically see that's, that's a lot of time, right? Like 17 hours, 36 hours, that's a lot of time in order to start treating somebody for sepsis and to try to improve their, their, work, their risk of mortality. Uh, and so, and so we'd like basically to be able to encourage uh, physicians to, to administer antibiotics and things like that faster, right? Okay, so um, in terms of our data, we look at there were 52 inpatient encounters at Duke University over the course of 18 months. Um, we used 14,000 for testing. Um, uh, and we looked at six months of future data, and basically we looked at six months of future data. Um, we had 31 longitudinal variables, six vitals, 25 labs, like I talked about, um, a whole bunch of baseline covariates and medication classes. <coughs> and we compared um, the uh, multivariate GP RNN kind of model that we had just we just talked about to a raw RNN. So this is basically like an RNN without looking at it, sort of team without trying to estimate lens and vitals values and just um, um, carrying the last value seen forward. Um, uh, penalized logistic regression and then series and news are basically two clinical uh, scores that people come up with. And what we, what we can see is basically the MGPRNN that went, we went through, uh, performed way better than the other methods. So that's good. Um, we can also look at false alarms because remember I talked about, like, you know, with the news, with the news score, and the alarms are going off all the time, and the nurses are shutting them off because they're just going off all the time. So that's something that we're also very sensitive to, right? We don't want to have something that alerts constantly, right, and that people just start ignoring. Um, so we looked at false alarms per true alarm um, by, by uh, amongst all of the methods there. Um, and we looked at an 80% sensitivity, so basically you were getting 80% um, of the, the cases correct. Um, the x-axis is hours before the onset of sepsis. The y-axis is the false alarm, virtual alarm rate. Um, and we also saw, saw, basically see that our, the method that we talked about is much better at sort of eliminating false alarms. So we, so basically, we're in the process of trying to pilot the system at Duke University Hospital. So in order to do this, like we have like a computational method, the method has higher accuracy, the method has lower false fall alarm rates, that's great, we can help a lot of people. But in order to help a lot of people, we've been, we have to be able to get this information to uh, clinicians in a way that they can digest, right? So one of the things that um, we're basically in the process of doing is, is developing like the web app. I have shown you, I show, I'm showing you a mock-up of it right here. Um, but basically like this is a web app where you have each of the people who are on inpatient by name. This is not their real name. That would be a terrible info violation. Um, so each of, their, each of their names on top, each of the inpatient names, um, uh, the time on the axis showing what their risk for sepsis is over time, what their current risk for sepsis is in the upper left, um, and then other statistics about them. And then, you know, given what their risk is, we can choose to start them on some kind of treatment, or we being the doctors can choose to start them on some kind of treatment because I can't do anything. But um, the doctors can start them on some, some kind of treatment, and the, this kind of treatment comes in bundles, right? It's regulated, it comes in bundles. If you start treating somebody for sepsis, you have to do certain things three hours out, and six hours out, etc. So it also reminds clinicians about what it is they have to do at what time going forward. Oh. 
Okay, so that basically, so that was that was presented at ICML here a couple of days ago. Um, the next thing I can talk about is surgery, going back to my outline. So the surgery data was data um, that, how am I doing on time? Sorry. Half an hour. Okay, cool. Um, the surgery data was data um, that wasn't just collected from the EHR, but um, is also given in this national database, right? So now we have to decide what is it that we do both about trying try to combine uh, EHR data on local to do and uh, data that's given to us from a national database. So um, basically, um, in terms of surgeries, 15 out of, of, out of 100 surgeries that are performed could result in some kind of complication. And we'd like to try to minimize that. Um, so in 2014, Duke University spent more than $9 million in post-operative com complications. This is a slide that the hospital administration finds very compelling. Um, and so we are given this um, National Surgical Quality Improvement Program data set, which looks at um, patients who have gone into surgery across the US, what their covariates were going in, and what their outcomes were in terms of complications coming out. It looks at over 3.7 million patients nationwide and over 700 hospitals, and it includes things like demographic information, post-operative, pre-operative, sorry, pre-operative labels, uh, disease indicators, intraoperative variables like surgery time and outcomes of the surgery, like did you have some kind of like wound infection? Okay, so recently there was a paper published in JAMA basically showing like it turns out, lo and behold, that just belonging to this program didn't mean you got better outcomes in terms of your surgery. So, like, you actually have to use the data for something in order to get better outcomes in terms of surgery. This was apparently a big surprise to them. I don't, I don't know, um, but it's it's something that that we that we looked at and we're like, okay, we can do that. We can actually use this data in order to try to predict what kinds of surgical complications uh, somebody is likely to have. Okay, so the first thing we did was look at uh, just some kind of penalized logistic regression, right? Um, and so you can see just using penalized logistic regression, you can do pretty well. You can do pretty well predicting whether or not somebody is going to have all kinds of complications coming out of surgery. Now, I will compare like penalized logistic regression to what actually goes on now at Duke Hospital, which is the surgeon enters your room, they look at you and they're like, mm, you're good to go, right? Like, so just having penalized logistic regression there is an improvement over what happens right now. Um, one of the nice things about having this model is that it's interpretable, so we can look at what's being rated highly for different kinds of complications. And some of the things are not things that we're going to be able to do something about, like, is this a patient with esophageal cancer? Um, but some of the things are things that we can potentially do something about, like, this is a patient with nutritional deficiency, let's get them a nutritional console, let's try to improve their status before they actually go into surgery. And so, um, so basically, like our main goal is to have uh, physicians being able to ground with this kind of information about the patients that are coming out of surgery, and to be able to see it in a nice way, sort of like on something like an iPad. Um, so we've developed this um, web app that people are currently grounding with at Duke University Hospital, which again lists um, the person's name. This is a lot the kind of thing that you saw with the sepsis, right? Like the, the patient's name, the procedure that they just went through, um, and what kinds of complications they could have, their current risk um, that, that we estimate their risk, that, what, what we estimate their risk to be uh, at for this particular complication. And if they click on the treatment bundle for that particular complication, what they'll see are the different risk factors that the patient has that's playing into them having a risk as high as they currently do, and all of the interventions that they can make that can potentially do something about um, the, the uh, complication that we're looking at. So uh, this is, I think, um, yeah, complications. 
Um, there are some things that, uh, from a mach machine learning perspective that we've also worked on. Um, so one of the things that factors in a lot into this model are uh, CPT codes, the procedural codes for um, like what surgery the person is going into. And right now those procedural codes are put into groups and they're hand grouped by clinicians basically based on what clinicians have thought are similar to each other. And so we were like, okay, well, what if we take these CPT group codes and group them together based on what's going to give us the best prediction? Um, in terms of what their risk for complications might be. And so uh, we used a clustering method in order to be able to do that. We developed a clustering method to do that, and we got some improvement in a whole bunch of outcomes from doing that. Um, another problem that we have is we want to be able to use this national data together with our local Duke data, so we don't expect that the national data looks exactly like what our local Duke data does. And what we're really interested in is being able to make these predictions for our, our patients locally. Right? So we want to say, how is it that we can best kind of like transfer over information from the national data set to our local Duke data in order to provide the best prediction for um, our, our local patient. So here's the local patient, John Smith. Um, we want to be able to combine the national data and the local data, come up with some kind of tailored risk profile, individualized, customized for him, and have physicians be able to see it. So this means that we want to be able to do transfer learning across hospitals. Um, and so one of the things we've, we've worked on developing recently is a hierarchical infinite factor model, which allows us to do this. So basically, it accounts for the underlying variability in the data through a sparse de uh, decomposition of the, the covariance matrix. And it allows for the sharing of information across different sources of data while allowing each population to have its own idiosyncrasies. So again, there are lots of different kinds of hospitals, for example. In the national data set, there are community hospitals, there are university hospitals, etc. That's not true of our hospital. Our hospital is a major university hospital, right? So the patient population is not going to look exactly the same. Um, and so I'll skip this. You guys know what factor models are, right? So we basically came up with a hierarchical um, infinite factor model. So basically we said, okay, can we find sort of like this, um, this low dimensional manifold which captures a lot of the information about um, what our patient populations look like across different hospitals. And um, in order to do that, we said, okay, we're going to let the factor of loadings matrix vary sort of hospital to hospital. So we uh, use a hierarchical Dirichlet process in order to do this, um, like uh, within the factor model. So we can say, okay, we're going to draw this um, sort of global um, uh, factor of loadings matrix and then let each hospital's factor of loadings, actual factor of loadings that get used vary a little bit and the way in which they vary will depend hospital to hospital on exactly what's going on there. Um, and we found, uh, surprisingly, um, that, not surprisingly, uh, that uh, doing this kind of transfer learning was helpful um, in order to be able to, again, predict uh, the complications that people were experiencing. Um, so we compared our model to like the model that we have but just changed trained on the national data, and our model just trained on the local Duke data, um, and also just uh, using Lasso, just using the kind of like logistic regression kind of model that we talked about before. Um, and we found that we did better in many, many cases. Um, one of the things that we're working on right now is, is we've got this going, we've got this going using uh, straight up give sampling, but in order to apply it to a lot of data, because our national database is really large, we really, really want to speed up the inference, and so we're working right now on speeding up the inference using a uh, stochastic gradient in a Hoover that was not sampling. Um, but I think in, in terms of our goals, um, more generally, um, we would like to be able to have this kind of risk prediction model and we'd like to be able to follow a patient through their whole surgical journey or whatever. Um, so uh, basically a patient comes in, they're going to have surgery, we would like the first thing that happens to be that our, our uh, algorithms make predictions about how likely is this patient uh, to suffer from complications down the road. Um, 
there are a whole bunch of preoperative assessments that go on with different patients. So, um, so right now we've got clinicians thinking like, okay, um, if somebody's at low risk for a complication, they can just do a phone screen. If they're at high risk for a complication, um, they can go to one of our very specialized uh, clinics, which they call like Poet or, or Posh. Um, what you really want are patients to go there if it's going to help them a lot, right? Um, so there's a whole causal inference, I haven't talked about that, there's a whole causal inference kind of like component to this work where we're saying, okay, these different kinds of preoperative assessments, these different ways of stratifying patients, how much difference are they actually making, right? Like how, how, how can we tell that? Um, but we'd like, ideally, like to have some kind of risk prediction model which follows the patient from the second that they step in the door to the second that they leave, right? So going from preoperative to postoperative, and ideally in real time during the operation itself. Or working on it. Okay. Um, so, uh, right, so that's most of what I have to say about surgery. And then the last thing that I'm going to talk about is uh, multiple sclerosis. So um, I talked about having, um, having these outpatient clinics that are affiliated with Duke University. And so um, one of the people who I collaborate with is an I'm a specialist neurologist. Um, and so one of the problems with um, these outpatient clinics when you have a chronic disease like multiple sclerosis is that like they, they basically don't really collect any data. So like even if you can pull data out of the HR, there's not a lot of data actually being put in. So it's like if I could do something, it would be to take the chair of every medical department at Duke and sit them in a room and be like, look, it's great that you guys are using the EHR, but you're basically using it as a billing system. And so if you want the EHR to be able to make good predictions about disease, you have to think about the data that you're collecting in those terms, right? So we're not really collecting normally any kind of useful data about somebody's multiple sclerosis, and so we want to change that and make it better. Um, and so the way in which we have thought to do that is, um, I mean, these, these are people who go to a clinician maybe once every three or four months, right? They see um, they have a specialist neurologist. But it would be even better if we had something that was collecting data on them almost constantly. Right. So, um, so what we're doing is we're developing this web application. Okay. So multiple sclerosis, they're really chaotic symptoms. There are a whole bunch of them, and the onset duration and severity don't really like they don't necessarily tell you very much. There are these broad classes of different kinds of MS that you can have, but it's not well defined. Even MS itself is not very well defined. Um, so the question we had is how can we monitor this continuously and start making sense of what's going on? How can this benefit the patient? How can it benefit the pro provider? And so in this web app, I mean in this mobile phone app, again, we're about two weeks from release. Um, we have an embedded consent process. We have a disease history survey. We have a daily symptom and medication survey. Um, exportable relapse or something in MS called a relapse survey and five different activities that they can do. Um, we also have the ability to pair with uh, wearable devices through HealthKit in order to say, okay, we're possibly collecting a bunch of data about your activity levels and sleep patterns, um, and so we're going to put those in the app also. Um, we have a single notification, uh, so basically like we realize that all of this information is a high burden on the patient and we want to make this as low a burden as possible. Um, so we just have a notification where if nothing's changed from the day before, they can just be like, nothing's changed and they'll repopulate with whatever the previous day's answer is in a couple of seconds. This is a, an example of the daily survey that you're seeing right now, what are their different symptom, symptom levels like. On the right is the dashboard where they can view what their symptoms look like over multiple days or their performance on various tasks over multiple days. Um, uh, again, on the left is um, what their medication diary looks like. This is where they can store the different uh, drugs that they're on. The middle is the weekly reports that they get. This is what your MS has been like this week. 
And on the right is the provider report that the provider can see, which is like, this is a summary of what's been happening with this patient since their last provider visit. Um, so in terms of the neurologist that I collaborate with, one of his main complaints is like, he doesn't even know how to start the conversation with the patient. It's like, how have you been? Okay, you know, like, what, I mean, what, you know, what do you really expect? <laughs> um, so this at least gives you um, a place to start. It's uh, what symptoms have been bothering you most over the time between um, when you last see a doctor and now. And I'm going to start with these at once. And so on the left, what you see is um, there's also kind of like a resources, like learn more section which will tell you about the different symptoms that you might you have to be having. We partnered with the Multiple Sclerosis Society in order to try to bring you information and bring the patient information about different drugs and symptoms. And on the right is an example of a tapping task that we have integrated into the system. Um, we thought a little bit about gamification, right? Like how is it, you know, that we're gonna keep people interested in, in these tasks kind of like long-term going forward? Um, what do different, uh, patients doing different things actually tell you about their um, that about their illness, and there are a whole bunch of um, analyses that we can do in line with what you've been seeing throughout this whole talk. I won't go into them, right? But if you wanted to do something time series related, you can use Gaussian processes. If you want to do um, some uh, some population understanding, you can use directionally processed mixture models. Um, and so the, those are probably the, thing, the first things that we would think of trying with this data. I mean, again, like the, the causal inference, um, the causal inference questions are, are are really significant, right? Like, what is actually causing uh, these people's problems, and what is it that we can do about it in terms of interventions? Um, and sort of the last thing I'm going to say is like we want to in the future combine uh, data from this app with data that we're getting other places. So in in um, in order to be able to make um, statements about the biology, right, we have to have biological data. So we have some OH data that's collected on MS uh, patients through something called the Murdoch study that we have going on in North Carolina. Um, and then we also have like MRIs that are taken of all of the patients that come into the Duke University Health System. And what we want to do is we want to be able to try to correlate the app data we have with, with that data in order to be able to make biological sort of <laughs> statements. Okay, and the last thing I want to say is thanks to my students. That's Joe you see on the left, and he's done a lot of work with sepsis and CKD. Liz in the middle, she's done a lot of work with surgery. Kai has done a lot of work with influenza, which I didn't even get to talking about, but that's cool work too. You can look up on our group website if you're interested. Um, and uh, that some of the MS stuff, the neurology, I haven't broke a student into that yet because like, until we have data, like there's nothing to really do your PhD thesis on and I feel a little bit badly, but my uh, neurology collaborator is the person.